I'm going to start off this morning by reading the gospel text. It's um, a text from Mark, the 13th verse. I'm sorry, the 13th chapter, beginning at the first verse, if, if you want to follow along. Otherwise, just um, I will read it um, now. As Jesus left the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, look, what awesome stones and buildings. Jesus responded, Do you see these enormous buildings? Not even one stone will be left upon another. All will be demolished. Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives across from the temple. Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? What sign will show us that all these things are about to come to an end? And Jesus said, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many people will come in my name saying, I'm the one. They will deceive many people. When you hear of wars and reports of wars, don't be alarmed. These things must happen. But this isn't the end yet. Nations and kingdoms will fight against each other, and there will be earthquakes and famines in all sorts of places. These things are just the beginning of the sufferings associated with the end. Watch out for yourselves. People will hand you over to the councils. You will be beaten in the synagogues. You will stand before governors and kings because of me so that you can testify before them. First, the good news must be proclaimed to all the nations. My sister and I love riding roller coasters. Um, Pam and I have ridden dozens in our lives. If you guys don't know, Pam's my sister. Um, um, The bigger, the faster, the more loops, the better. Um, We lived in a lot of different cities while we were growing up. So we got to go to some really cool amusement parks. In Denver, we had Elitch Gardens. In Pennsylvania, there was Hershey Park. Up in Orange County, we had Knott's Berry Farm and Disneyland. And while we were in Houston, we went to Six Flags Astro World. And I'm sure I'm leaving some out, but those were the most memorable. Later in our lives, about 2005 or 2006, Pam and I were taking a trip to Las Vegas to visit our parents. We made a plan to stop along the way at a place that we'd heard a little bit about, and we were curious. Just over the state line in Prim, Nevada, there's a place called Buffalo Bills. It's a hotel and a casino, but that's not why we wanted to go there. We were interested in this because it had a roller coaster that you could see from the interstate. Driving by, it looks fun. So we thought we'd be comfortable trying that out. You see, I hadn't been told much about it except that it was fun. If I could have read the description that is now posted on the website for this roller coaster, I may have thought twice. So I'm going to share that description with you all. It says, the Desperado roller coaster ride facts. The ride duration, 2 minutes, 43 seconds. The length, 5,843 feet. The maximum height, 209 feet. The biggest drop, 225 feet. The maximum speed, and I love how they put this, about 90 miles an hour. The ride's special features are described like this. It says, a high-speed dive down a 55-degree hill into a tunnel, followed by a 155-foot second hill. (laughs) That's, That's higher than most other coasters' first drops. Desperado Roller Coaster is one of the tallest and fastest roller coasters in the entire country. The ride starts off slow and serene. Talk about keeping you in suspense. But this is your chance to admire the scenery of the southwest mountain ranges and deserts. Once you hit that 209-foot peak, you'll plummet through a tunnel, reaching speeds close to 90 miles an hour. Just when you thought the scare was over, Desperado's second drop is a thrilling 155-foot-tall spiral. This ride features a 4G force, 
To give you an idea of how strong it is, astronauts feel 3.5 Gs on a space shuttle takeoff. Just imagine the fluttering of your stomach during the experience. This ride is not for the faint of heart. Okay, I have to tell you, that first drop drops you into a tunnel that is pitch black darkness. It caused me, for the first time in my life, to assume the fetal position, and I think I actually blacked out for a second. It was overwhelmingly terrifying. Now, prior knowledge may have helped me to prepare for it, but then again, maybe I would have just stayed in the car and kept driving. But I'm glad that without knowing exactly what I was getting myself into, I took the chance. Maybe there are times in your lives when prior knowledge could have changed your experience had you known more about what to expect or what to fear. Today's passage that I read from Mark uses the apocalyptic style of writing, which was common in ancient times. It was used to move people out of their daily reality into an edgy, anxiety-provoking, and thought-provoking story. It encouraged people to act now or deal with the consequences that would befall a non-believer. You know, kind of like repent now or else kind of message. Apocalyptic literature can be scary reading. There are mythical monsters and demons. There is a separation from God's rule into a world ruled by Satan. And there's typically a transition between the world, which includes wars, plagues, and a variety of natural disasters. All of these things were typically included in apocalyptic texts. Scripture holds many examples besides this passage. For instance, in the Old Testament, the book of Daniel is apocalyptic. So Jesus uses an apocalyptic approach as he shares about what would be coming in the end days. It definitely gets the reader's attention with the powerful imagery of suffering and destruction. Jesus is letting the disciples in on what they can expect in their futures. The passage starts out with an innocent enough question of one of the disciples. As he's admiring the beauty of the temple, he commented on how magnificent it was. The disciples were in awe of the huge stones, so perfectly placed to form the most splendid of structures. So with starry eyes and amazement, the disciple says, Teacher, look what awesome stones and buildings. And Jesus says, Do you see those enormous buildings? They'll be demolished. He points to the destructive powers that are to come and says, Not even one stone will be left unturned. In true apocalyptic fashion, Jesus continues telling them that the world to come will include deception from false prophets and messiahs and suffering from famines and wars and earthquakes. And, and well, that's just all part of the end. Oh, yeah, but don't be alarmed. I can't help but wonder what was going through the disciples' minds and what it must have taken for them to stay in Jesus' ministry after hearing all of that. As they were admiring the majesty of the temple, they hear that the world is going to be terrible. But don't be alarmed. So as Jesus tells all of this to his disciples, it surely brought them back down to earth. And we see the contrast of what the disciples say about the temple and what Jesus says. The dis disciple is overwhelmed at the beauty and the magnificence of the temple. And Jesus begins speaking of horrible struggles to come. He wanted them, and he wanted us to understand that not all things or all people appearing to be glorious last. He wanted them to grasp that they were on the verge of a worldwide transformation, and they weren't going to expect, understand, or enjoy it. We, too, find ourselves bothered by Jesus' words. Because we know of wars and earthquakes and numerous other destructive powers that threaten our world and threaten us. And are we to sit back and just not be alarmed? See, I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. 
Jesus doesn't tell the disciples to sit quietly on the sidelines while these wars and earthquakes all happen. He says they will happen, but don't be alarmed. Think about how many types of personal threats bother us. Fear will either move us to action or to inaction, to active engagement or to passive avoidance. Sometimes we find ourselves denying the tragic situations of our world, both the possible ones and the real ones, and we just go about our daily lives. We may have an earthquake preparedness kit at home, and maybe not. We may have a wildfire evacuation plan, and maybe not. See, I've heard some say that they refuse to live in fear and therefore refuse to accept the possibility that they may be affected by the next natural disaster. But you see, we know bad things happen, and that knowledge should be what moves us to do what is needed in hopes of making a difference. This is also true for our faith lives. When we are aware of societal conditions that may make us uncomfortable or even terribly sad, what can we do? When we know that there are others suffering, what do we do? Many times we may feel that there isn't much we can do because of a physical distance from a crisis or the complexity of a crisis. But I know there is more that I can do just within my own community, yet I miss opportunities because I'm not always looking for them. With another mass shooting just a couple weeks ago, the distance between here and Thousand Oaks may cause us to feel as if there's no way to help the healing for those who were affected. But our quilters recently answered the request of Cal Lutheran University for quilt donations for the affected students on their campus. What a wonderful way to show love and support to others who just need a tangible sign of compassion after such a tragic day. And still, I'd guess that most of us maybe feel like there's nothing we can do to prevent another such tragedy. This past week, I spent three days in El Paso, Texas, and Juarez, Mexico. It was an opportunity to learn a lot about the current situation on our southern borders. I'm still trying to sort out all of the information that was presented. And at this point, I'm not sure anyone has the perfect solution to this ongoing crisis that affects so many people on both sides of our borders. It can be easy to ignore the problems and the controversies surrounding the immigration issues, but is that what we're called to do? To sit quietly by on the sidelines and wait for the problem to pass? You see, I'm struggling with knowing how to even begin to help, or who to help, or when to help. That feeling of helplessness in a crisis can be paralyzing. I remember how helpless I felt when we were all evacuated in 2007 for the fires that tore through this area. Getting away from imminent danger and waiting to regain some sense of normalcy was a terribly helpless feeling. I can only begin to imagine what our neighbors to the north are feeling in their time of fire and crisis. We might have to struggle to figure out good ways to actively help others. But if we are simply waiting comfortably for the end that Jesus is speaking of, holding on to our promised salvation and feeling confident as we take it for granted, then we miss the whole point of the Gospels. I don't think Jesus is saying to not be alarmed at the suffering and needs of others so that we don't move to action. I think he's saying don't be alarmed so that our fear of that suffering doesn't stop us from acting. We aren't called to get comfortable in our faith and settle into our recliners at home or our seats at church and wait for the end that Jesus is speaking of. The last verse of our gospel lesson today says, 
first the good news must be proclaimed to all nations. That's where our call is. And that's probably where our fear lies as well. We want to be comfortable with the assurance that comes from a faith of salvation as promised through our Lord Christ Jesus, but never so comfortable to the point of complacency in proclaiming and living out that gospel. Living a life in Christ's promise can be difficult. Why should we take a chance to reach out and risk being rejected? Why speak up for the rights of others when there's a likelihood of being shouted down? Why step out of our comfort zones when it just feels good to lean into all that God has blessed us with? Well, the answer to the why is simply Jesus. Jesus is relying on us to take those chances to step outside of our own selfish fears and insecurities to spread his message of love and of peace. Through the giving of ourselves, listening with open hearts, and working to know and love others, we are spreading the gospel of God's love and sacrifice through Jesus Christ. We serve to love, and we love to serve, because that's what Jesus taught us. And in the hardest of times, and the most tragic of events, We are to serve and love our neighbors, putting our fears aside and riding this roller coaster that is life on earth. And we are called to ride it to the best of our ability. and for the glory of God, all while trusting in his grace. Let's pray together. Merciful and just God, in all of creation we see your loving hand that brought this world and each of us to life. As this life continues to be filled with trying times and suffering and doubts and fear, guide us to do your will. Open our eyes to the needs of others. Open our hearts to those in pain. Give us courage to overcome what holds us back from reaching out to others. We give you thanks for your loving grace that guides us in good times and in bad. Be present to all who need to know your love and bring comfort to all those who are in sorrow. All of this we ask in the name of your Son, our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen.